Let's get into my message this morning. We're starting, we turned a corner, and you know, as, as most of you have been around me, September and October is the months when I try to shoot and target for my um, harvest time. And we begin to look at harvest in, the, in this perspective. I was raised on a farm in the Midwest, and I, I come into it and come to it naturally. This was my, my uh, we were harvesting whatever co- crop we had grown, corn, we had come into it, beans a lot of times, we had uh, hay, we would stock up and start baling hay and putting it in there. And some of you, if you were farmers, you know what I'm talking about. This is also the time when all those good vegetables become good and ripe and you can, ha- you can have them, you know, and it all starts, we're t- coming to the end of that. And harvest time is a time when we look at this and it just so happens that this being Labor Day kind of leads me right into this next few weeks that I'm going to be preaching about that. But I want you to think about the idea of, of the harvest and, the, and working towards the harvest. And then, of course, you'll know that we are building up a harvest uh, festival that we're going to be having at the end of October. And that's our, one of our ministries. We, we love it. And if you're, if you're not familiar with this, we, our, our goal is to minister to at least 300 people. And we would love it if it was 300 people that didn't attend here on a regular basis. That we would go outside of our regular congregation. That you would help us to get the flyers and information out so that we can touch the hearts and minds of people that are not normally here. We're not doing this just for us. We're doing this for those that can come. We minister to those in the community and those that are around the area. And we are going to pass out flyers and we're going to be getting some things, some information to you. And we want you to help us with that because that's what the church has got to be. We are not here to be hospice. Amen. We are a healing station to get you better so you can go out and work and minister. Amen. We are not here to hold your hand till you pass on. Boy, that's quiet in here. Man, man. We want you to be better so you can minister more effectively and reach others. Amen? And so this morning I'm going to share. Now, Sister Nadine, would you just stand for just a minute? Just stand up. I, I love this woman. She is from Maricopa. She moved out there with her son and her family. And she moved out there and she will come in when she can. But it's hard for her to get up and drive in. Nadine, how, is it okay if I ask you how old you are? Well, I do, but I'm asking you, do you know? Yes. Well, you can tell me. I'm 90 years old, and in January, I'll be 91. 90 years old right now. Still driving, so when you see her van on the road, pray. But I'm just kidding, Sister Nadine, I love you. Amen. That's she. She drives in. Her kids are a little bit concerned about her driving still yet, but she said, "Pastor, I want to come to church, and if I'm coming to town anyways, I'm coming to church." This morning, she asked me to read something, and it just fits in with what I'm going to read. And so, I wanted you to be the one who gets the credit for it. All right. I, I know you didn't write it, but she found this, and she said, "Pastor, would you read this?" And I think that what you need to realize is, is how unique God makes, brings things together and how great these things fit together. And she gave this to me right before I walked up to the pulpit. And she said, Pastor, I know that I can read this, but I want a man to read it. And she said, would you? I guess she was w- looking for a, a man and she couldn't find one until she found me. Anyways. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, he does. Amen. Well, I'll do my best. And she's got it on a couple different papers, and it's really small print. So it's, I'll try my best to read this. She asked me to, and I'm going to. It says, The touch of the master's hand, t'was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. What am I to bid, good folk? He cried, who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two. Two dollars, who will make it three? Going for three, but no. From the back of the room, 
a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow and then wiping the dust from the old violin tightened and loosened the strings he played a melody pure and sweet a caroling angel sings the music ceased the aux and the auctioneer with a voice that was quite quiet and low said now what am I to bid for the old violin and he held it up with the bow a thousand dollars who will make it two two thousand we'll make it three three thousand once three thousand twice and going and gone cried he the people cheered but someone some of them cried we don't understand what changed its worth quick came the reply the touch of the master's hand and now a man with the with life out of tune a battered and scarred with sin it is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd much like the old violin a mess of pottage a glass of wine a game a, a, and he travels on he is going once going twice he's going almost gone but the master comes and and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that it's wrought by the touch of the master's hand amen I don't know about you but that kind of makes me feel like that I am worth something because I was you know I, I wasn't an old violin I was I remember when I was about 19 or 20 and I was cast out and was pretty much said that I was never going to amount to much had a lot of things that held me back but you know where you were when God found you maybe you were that old violin that was sit there and everybody wrote you off and said you're never gonna be anything but you know what when God touches your life he changes it and makes it something beautiful for him amen thank you Nadine for sharing that this morning amen this morning, if you have your Bibles, I want to I want to go now take that thought that sh the old violin, if you will, just take this thought and and realize this, how that they had a mind to work. Uh, work is not a bad word. And, and did, did my first one come up where it said the scripture found in Nehemiah four and six? There it is. Nehemiah four and six. And so if you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah. I'm going to be preaching a little bit out of out of Nehemiah this morning for just a few minutes. Work is not a bad word. Just, just because it's a four-letter word doesn't mean it's bad. Work is not bad for you. It can be hard on you, as Don and James did to me the other day. It can be hard on you. It can be knuckle-busting like Andre working, taking a, a car apart in a junkyard to try to get a radiator mount. Uh, you, you, some of you know what I'm talking about. Work is hard. But, but it doesn't have to be a bad word. A, a, a little hard work won't kill you. I never will forget when I was working on the farm and, and sweat dripping off me. I, I was barely big enough to lift uh, the bales of hay that were coming down the chute. And when they, the guys that were working there told me, they said, get in line, your chute, your, your, ba your bale's coming next. And so when I went to pick it up, Don, I could barely grab it. And I, had, I hadn't learned how to throw that thing around. And I picked up that bale of hay and it was almost as much as I weighed and throwing it around. And it, by the end of the day, I was sweating and I was tired and I was weak and I was weary. And I said, this hard work is going to kill me. You ever been there before? Sometimes if you've ever had to do math homework and you don't like math, sometimes, why did you look towards your brother? Are you... <laughs> Sometimes when we do something, a task that's hard, it becomes very difficult for us. And work sometimes is different. Sometimes physical work doesn't really bother us as much as mental work. Anybody who's sat down behind a new computer can testify to that. Sometimes we, we get the, the, the way that we work and how that we work has changed a little bit. And we don't always work with our physical body as much. Don's favorite saying is you work smarter, not harder, right? That's what he tells me all the time as I, as I work myself to death. And, 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 and he, he tells me that. You, you know, you didn't tell you that the other day. You didn't tell me that the other day, Don. You just said, just, it didn't have no smarts to it. Maybe that's why I was there. But, 
when we were working on it, I began to realize something. And looking into Scripture, work has been a part of man's life ever since the fall of sin. Even before that, God had given man the assignment, and man's assignment to work with was to name all the animals of the garden and all of the, the creatures and creation that God had. And he was going through the process of that, but the curse brought the, 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 the change of work to where work became very difficult and very hard. Look at what it says in Genesis, the third chapter, verses 17, 18, and 19. This is after man had sinned and God is applying the, the, the curse to mankind. And he says, and then Adam, uh, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. Uh, oh, listen, that'll preach right there, guys. But anyways, we'll move on. Just a reminder of that next time when you get home. But anyways, well, uh, and have eaten from the tree which I, have, which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for, you, for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. And the sweat of your face shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of the ground you were taken, and for, out, uh, for the dust you are, and the dust you shall return. And God gave them three folds, uh, if you will, of, of difficult work and hard labor. He said, first of all, that this hard labor would be a toiling task of a, of a, of a nature of working with the ground and bringing up something that's difficult in thorns and thistles. And, and Don, you don't know what an illustration my, my work was. And literally, uh, um, we had thorns that were that long. I kid you not. I wear some of those even yet today. We, we were loading that brush into there and we were seeing those thorns. And I was thinking, Lord, why in the world would you create a thorn that would stick me like that? And I thought maybe he did it just because he was trying to create the crown of thorns and, and every time that those thorns would stick me in the leg or stick me in the hand, and I, I would be thinking, why did you create those? I was only thinking about one thing. Jesus had to have a crown of thorns placed on his head, and I'm crying because I have to throw a few away. But we were, when I, when I begin to think about the idea of the, of this, that was the number one thing. They had to, to work and to toil. The second thing is, is that they had to work by the sweat of their brow. They, anybody ever worked hard enough to sweat? Some of you are just not into amen in me today. You're just not agreeing with me. So, or else some of you are really getting lazy and you don't remember those days. When you, all you have to do is to sweat is to just walk outside in Arizona. I mean, it just doesn't take much. But when you, when you think about this idea of toiling so hard that you work hard enough to sweat. Now, the other day I was, I was there and, and, and I was working around and just doing a few things around the church and and I sat down and I said to an individual that was there, I said, I, I worked hard enough to start sweating. And he looked at me and he said, oh, sweat is good. And I said, no, sweat is not good. When I work hard enough to sweat, that means I'm doing too much. I'm just saying where I was that day now, come on. When, and, you know, I, I told him, I said, you know, it, it, when, but the sweat of the brow was the third thing. And the fourth, uh, or the third thing that, that he tells us was the part of the curse was that man would die. Up to this point, man had never had been given the promise to death. We don't know if man would have lived forever. God created us so that we would be eternal. But because of sin and the nature of sin, it crept in to begin to destroy the life of man. And man became, a, 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 from the dust they came, and from the dust the Bible says that we would return. And so we see the nature of where that comes from. And, and, and we look at this, this is the beginning phase of when the promise of work was coming. So I looked at this and I, I thought, well, just in case, there are a few people in this congregation that do not know what work really means. I want to show you. Write these down, parents, so you can show them to your children. The definition of work, I looked it up on Google, so it's got to be right. It says, the, work, the word work actually means an activity involving mental or physical, <coughs> mental or physical effort <laughs> done in order to achieve a purpose or result. When you look at that, this is a, a, a mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or result. It can be an accomplishment. Now, we know that work, when we think about work, it sometimes can be a work in the detail of sweating or, or the effort that's laid into it. But work is something that comes to all of us. 
I want to look at this a little bit, breaking it down into the nature of where the children of Israel had been, and Judah, especially the tribe of Judah, had been captured. And they had been taken away from their homeland. And all of, of, the, of their homeland, Jerusalem, had been destroyed. Everything about their home had been destroyed. The, the walls had been torn down. The, everything had been stripped and taken away. All that was valued had been taken away. And Nehemiah, in the first chapter of Nehemiah, finds out that, the, that, 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 that Jerusalem had been destroyed. And when he gets the information, he sits down and begins to weep. And he begins to cry about the destruction and the problems and the circumstances. And then he begins to share it with the expression of the king. And he shares it with his people. And they begin to gather together. And they see the need for and the necessity for repairing the walls and repairing the city. So it doesn't look so bad. It needed to be improved. Anybody see any similarity in this country? It has gotten so bad, and it needs to be improved. There's a lot of things that are wrong here. And I'm going to tell you something. We need to start gathering together and gathering the pieces and begin to rebuild and make a... I know this expression. I Please don't. I'm not a, a mag... How do you say that, Dave? MAGA hat wear? That's not, I'm not saying that today. But I believe that if we're going to truly rebuild America, we have got to begin to take the things that Satan has destroyed from it and begin to build back to the principles where we can be effective for the kingdom of God again. We need to come to a place to where we grasp the change that God can help us with. And we must see and realize it. Now, I'm, I'm going to jump down here just a few minutes to my, my text. And I want to read this this morning before I get too far away. Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, verse 6 says, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its entire, half of its, of its height. For the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. They had a thought. They had a motion. They had a notion. They had a need. They saw an opportunity. They saw something that needed to be done, and they put their hands to it, and they began to work. They began to see some things that needed to be done. What does it mean to have the people had a mind to work? As the simple effort was as they saw the need and they did something about it. They took an opportunity that was there before them and they made a difference. And so many times we'll go through the motion and we'll go through and we'll see the needs around us and we'll walk right by the need and ignore it as if it doesn't exist and pretend that it will go away on its own. If we truly want to change, then it's got to start with us making a difference in the world that we live in. We've got to make a difference. The world is very comfortable wallowing in its own sin. And as a matter of fact, that's what the problem with the world is, is we become so comfort driven that all we want to do is pacify our treasures and our lust. We will become comfortable in ourselves. become comfortable in our own ways. We don't see our need. Nehemiah, the second chapter in Nehemiah, the Bible says, And then he said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and the gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them, The hand of God which had been good upon us, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise and build, right? Let us rise up and build. And then they set their hands to a good work. Here's the, here's the thing that began to happen, and here's what begins to take place. They begin to see a need, and they begin to meet the need. And they begin to minister to it. They had saw it, they had heard about it, they had talked about it, and now they decided to trust God in it, and they begin to build. They, there wasn't a second thought. They didn't, they didn't ask and they didn't a committee. They didn't, they didn't put all their thoughts together and say, well, I don't know if we... They, they just saw it and they did it. They just saw it and they did it. They saw the destruction and they did something about it. You don't have to... If, if there is a snake that crawls in this building, we do not have to vote about what to do with the snake. We will not have to call the pastor's council together. We will not have to call the ministry. We don't have to do a worship service about what to do with the snake. All 
we got to do is kill the snake. And I'll be right behind whoever does it. I don't like snakes. And I can tell you this, that when it comes down to it, what we do is a lot of times when it comes down to the work, we begin to, we, we see a need in our family and we'll shy away because we don't want to offend anybody. Ooh, I'm preaching good whether you like it or not. We, we see a, a circumstance and we'll tiptoe around it because we, we don't want to fl- ruffle any feathers. But I'm going to tell you something. When it comes down to it, there's so much destruction. We've got to do something. And we as believers have got to rise up to the challenge that's before us to make a difference so that we can change the circumstances around us. God's put you where you are to make a difference. God's put you where you are so you can change the environment that you are in. He never left the church here so that we could just coast along and get along till he comes back. It's so that we can change the world and make a difference. The problem with it is, is that the church has become so much like the world that we failed to see the difference. If you want to watch that, it'll be online later if you want to hear that. Because I did say that. The church has got to make a difference. If we are not making a difference, we are just getting along. After Nehemiah had told the people, they began to put their hands to work. They saw the urgency of the work. They knew what needed to be done. They saw the need and they met it. Urgency of the work is something that Jesus told his disciples in John the ninth chapter. Verse 1, he says, and now Jesus uh, passed by and and he saw a man who was blind. and, And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, he said, neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who had sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man or no one can work. There is coming a time. There is coming a day. And and time will be that we'll miss the opportunities that God has placed before us to reach our loved ones and our families. We're quickly moving that way. When we'll look back and we'll say, I wish I would have said that. You see, I, I, I've done a few funerals in my, my ministry and I've heard people say that. I wish that I would have taken time. I like that, that thing. I think, Vi, I think you put it out there the other day. Uh, don't wait until I'm dead to buy me flowers. In other words, bring them to me now. Right? Don, are you going to go? I'm just asking. I think sometimes we need to realize that we don't have to wait until something falls apart to fix it. I don't think we have to wait until it breaks to make it work. And I think sometimes we have to realize the necessity and the need that God has for us and the work that He has planned for us because today is the day that we must play, put our hands to the plow and begin to work. Jesus said, this day while I can, while the time is now. Let me ask you this question. What are you waiting on? It's quiet in here, Chuck. (laughs) What are you waiting on? Are you waiting on another day or a better opportunity? There's no better day than when God brings you face to face with the circumstance. To do this, but we were in my office praying and Manny said he was up north. Wasn't it up north? In California. Oh, God's devil country. Anyways, anyways. (laughs) Just kidding, just kidding. He was in California and he was over there and uh, God told him to pray for a man's knee because he had had trouble with his knee and God had healed him. And he got busy and he said, I don't feel like I should. And he kind of ignored it. And then he, in the conviction, ate him up. He just said, I couldn't hardly stand it because God told me to do it and I just didn't do it. And then God opened up another opportunity when he was over here right across the street. God showed him a man that was sitting there, his knee was all swollen, and God said, go pray for that man. And so, Manny, did Laura go with you? And they prayed together for this man's knee. He said, Pastor, I don't know what came of it. All I know is that when God told me to do it, I did it. And listen, 
It's not up to you to create the miracle. That's God. That's faith in one bigger than you and better than you. What you got to do is simply be obedient to do what God places before you to do and trust God to do it. When I pray, I believe and thank God for it. Amen. But God is simply saying, what are you waiting on? Let me go on. The urgency to work, the necessity of the moment, the time that God has placed within us, the quality of work and the quantity of work. Is it which one is the most important? The quantity or the quantity or the quality or the quantity of work? You see, Jesus could raise the dead. Jesus rose from the dead himself. But he told us in John the 14th chapter and verse 12, he said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Now, Joe, I'm going to tell you something. I don't believe it gets too much greater than raising somebody from the dead. That's pretty big. That's a pretty big thing. Opening blinded eyes, opening the den, taking a man's ear who was cut off and putting it back on his ear and, and beginning to be able to hear from that ear. That's pretty miraculous. But Jesus told his disciples, he said, greater works than these will you do. And for, for the longest time, I was thinking, how is that going to, how can something be greater than those? And I realized through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost that every believer who prays the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he wasn't talking about the quality of the miracle, but the quantity of the miracles. Every believer who's walking in the power of the Holy Spirit dwells within them. The Bible says we should lay hands on the sick and they will recover. My dad scolded me the other day. You believe that? I'm 60 years old. My dad scolded me. I've been whining around long enough about my knee and I was complaining and I told him it cost too much, blah, blah, blah. I went on and on, tell him all that. He said, well, I'm going to get serious. I'm going to start praying. I'm thinking, well, now you're going to pray? And so a couple days later, he called me back. He said, how's your knee feeling? I said, well, it's feeling a little better. And he goes, well, it ought to. I prayed about it. I'm thinking, well, you don't know all the work and the things that I've done. I've had that propped up. I've tried to take it easy. I did all those things. And then he called me back the, a couple days later, and he said, is your knee better? And I said, well, yeah, I come to think of it. He says, well, you act surprised. I'm going to tell you something. I, when you pray, you believe, and you receive from God. My God is big enough to supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but if you have a need in your life right now, you need to trust God, you need to ask God, you need to believe God for it. And then right now, with you, just lift up your hands and begin to say, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing right now in me. Come on, amen. When you have a need, ask God for it. Now don't be surprised if God doesn't put you in a position to be a part of that miracle. When he tells you to share the gospel with one of your rotten little kids, come on. Or your neighbor that you don't like very well because he makes noise at midnight. God may be using you at right this very moment to share the love of Christ with someone that you don't really want to share the love of Christ with. Maybe it's a boss or a coworker or someone that you, come on. They, you don't have to preach to them. All you got to do is share the love of Christ. Sow the seed and begin to pray Amen. and let God take care. But we'll sit by, we'll complain, we'll gripe, we'll do all of the things that we can do and, and we won't do anything. The children of Israel began to work and Brother Farr, they didn't think it was possible, but they saw all the damage and they just simply got a hold of a rock on top of a rock and they began to move rocks around and they began to see what there was there and they started piling it up and everybody got busy and everybody began to work and they had their mind to set at work and they began to build a wall and they got it halfway up all the way around the city. And the task was unbelievable. Even those around them couldn't believe what they had done. Go ahead and pull that next one up. Something changed, though. In Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, down just a few verses in verse 10. The Bible says, and Then Judah said, The strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, 
They will neither know nor see anything till we come into our midst, uh, till they come into our midst and, and kill them and cause the work to cease. There, I want to ask this question. What happened? What happened from between verse 6 and what happened going on down to verse 10? They lost their focus and their mind became diluted by the lies of the enemy. Just like what happened with Manny, just like what happened with so many of us, when God puts it in our heart, we pass by someone, we'll sit by someone, and God will put it in our hearts to say something, and we'll ignore that thought because, well, it's just us. Are our enemies bigger? Are our, our enemies more ferocious? We, uh, we can't handle that. That's, we can't do all that. There's no way, God, we can't build that wall all the way up. They built it halfway around and they had a mind to work and things were moving so quickly and the things were happening so uh, they just couldn't figure it out. And then they got to complaining about all the rubbish. We don't have the right tools. I don't have the right skills. I don't have the I haven't been to the uh, uh, seminary yet, so I can't tell somebody how to, to go to meet Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. You know what? The, the thing I le learned the least in seminary and Joe helped me out with this, but they didn't teach me how to lead someone to Christ in seminary. They taught me how to teach the Word, but I learned to teach people to love Christ, and that's how I lead them to Christ. It's because I show them that I love them. Eric, if we're going to make a difference in this world, it's going to be because we show them the love of Christ. We're going to show them that God loves them. Because God loves them, we love them. Come on, Amen. I've seen some of you. If you, if you ever, if you ever get a chance, James, when we set it up, we're going down to the downtown again. We're going to go down. We're going to share the water bottles, and we're going to take some food down to the homeless again. And you, I'm going to tell you something. You get down there, and some, not, they're not all huggable, and they're sometimes hard to love. A lot of times, they're 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 very brash in their language. And, and, and you get down there and you think, well, I don't even know. Jesus wouldn't even come for them. Let me tell you something. Jesus died for them the same way he did for you. And they need to know the love of Christ. And they need to know that God loves them. And God hasn't forgotten them. And when we do that, we will see the love of Christ demonstrated and meet the need. What changed in their heart? What changed in their mind? It was the fact that they became overwhelmed by the lies and the circumstances which we find ourselves in. You can sit here today and make excuses why you cannot. You can do like every time that I read this scripture. When Moses was, was in the wilderness and he saw the burning bush, he made every excuse he could. I, I don't talk good enough. I'm not skilled enough. I don't have, we can make all those excuses why we can't. Or we can just say, I'll take what God you've given me and I'll make the best of it. With your anointing, I can do it. And when I do, the difference will make a great impact. You don't know what seed you planted in that man's life, Manny. He didn't see him get up and he didn't go leaping and jumping and praising God. But he knew somebody would pray for him. And he knew that God still knew he was there. Maybe that's all he needed for that day was just to know that God still loved him. Let me go on. Go ahead and pull the next one up, Robert. Luke 9th chapter, verse 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Now I want you to catch that phrase. Lord, I will follow you wherever you want me to go. That's, that's what we say. And then Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds have air, uh, of the air have nests, and, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, no, Lord, let me first go and, and bury my father. In verse 60, he says, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury the dead, uh, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61 says, and another said to him, Lord, I will follow you, uh, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Verse 62 says, but Jesus said unto him, no one having put his hands to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What that basically, all that scripture is saying is this. When you commit to it, do it. 
Just do it. Don't make excuses. Don't tell God, well, God, I've got to work it into my calendar. Because I can tell you something. I know God. He can clear a calendar in a hurry. He can make your schedule change. What you need to do is begin to say, God, if you want me to, I will do whatever you want me to do. Whatever it is, God, I will do it. I'm going to quickly wrap this up. But I will tell you something. When it comes down to the, the prayer that we must make is praying for the, the harvest and the work of it. And this is our theme scripture that we're going to be building on for the next few weeks. It's in the front of the, if you will, it's in the front of the um, evangel out there. Go ahead and pull that up. Matthew, the ninth chapter, verses 36 and 37. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. This is Jesus speaking here. And he says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they were weary and scattered like having sheep with no shepherd. And they said to his disciples, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I really believe with all my heart that what God is simply saying is, you see it, you know it. Turn on the news, you can watch it. We live in a world full of hatred, racism, sarcasm and sin. Wrong is being guaranteed to be right. People are adjusting their lifestyles so they can adjust to sin instead of saying sin is wrong and avoiding it. The church has got to change. We've got to be the example. Not to rebuke and cast out and chastise and set ourselves above it. But we've got to reach and extend a hand to help it. We have got to love others as Christ loved us. We have got to reach out to a lost and dying world and be Jesus to them as much as we can. The world needs a Savior. And we present it every day. We were at the beach and Roberto, if you'll come and get ready. A couple years ago, Kathy, Chris, you remember Kathy and my wife and I and JC and a few of our friends we go camping with together in California. We were here there in California and there was a guy that was dressed up and, and he was had a guitar and a cross and had the Jesus garment on with the Jesus beard and the Jesus hairdo and, and I forget his name do you remember I, re I don't remember either but uh, he was there and he was singing a song and, and 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 Kathy was so intrigued by this Jesus on the pier singing that she was so excited she said can you sing a Christian song? He said, no, ma'am, I just do this to get attention. I don't do Christian music. You see, the world is looking so hard. That we're drawn just by the appearance. But you know what the world really needs is people that act like Jesus. That they truly act like Jesus. He didn't ask us to look like him. He just acted and said we need to act like him. If we'll get busy, if we'll see it, if we'll just see the opportunity and say, what can I do? What can I do? There's all kinds of places to reach. There's so many that need Jesus. It's overwhelming. Sitting there with James the other day and we were talking about all the opportunities. Everything that we need. We need, we need so many things just to make it work. We just need people to step up and say, I'll do it. I don't know how. Pastor, you'll have to help me. Show me how. But I'll do it. They accomplished the task before them with the wall being built. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit, the desire that they saw, and they had a mind to work. They had a mind to do it. I want you to stand with me all across this place. Heavenly Father, right now, you know each of us. You know the opportunities that each of us have right now before us. Some it's our families. Some, some of it's because of the fact that we've, we've tried to reach them before and they've, they've, they've pushed us away, they've ignored us, they didn't want anything to do with us. There have been others today that God, they're struggling in their own, their own self and they haven't, they haven't ever truly surrendered everything to themselves, uh, to God. 
They're still holding on. They're still listening to the lies of the devil as to why they can't. Instead of saying, God, here I am. Use me. God, I'm praying that you begin right now. Let the presence of the Holy Spirit that's been touching lives in this sermon, let it begin to move in their hearts. Speak to their hearts right now, God. And Lord, right now, would you open our eyes as you did with the disciples to see the harvest? Would you open our eyes to see the task which is all around us? Let us see the devastation of our world. Not only the broader picture of the globe, not even the picture of, uh, of the United States, but God, would you let us see the brokenness in our homes and our families and with our close friends? Would you let us see that? Open our eyes, God, right now to the harvest, the need that is there. And help us to share the love of Christ with them right now. I want you just to reach over, take somebody by the hand. We're going to close very quickly. I, I know there's a lot of things in a lot of places that a lot of people got to be, but right now I feel a, a real strong urgency to just share this. Somebody in this place, you need to know that God loves you. God's been working on changing your life. And you've hid in a, in a secure place. And you've hid in a place to where you, 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 you thought you were, you were okay, but God keeps pushing you out of that security because you have skills and abilities to be used for the kingdom of God and you have shied away from it. And God is telling you there's no excuse. The opportunity is now. Use what I've given you. Put your hands in your heart to changing this world. Right now with your heads bowed and eyes closed, the first thing you need to do right now is to surrender your heart completely to Christ. You need to say, Lord, I surrender my heart, my life, my all to you, God. I, I quit playing games. I'm, I'm not going to bounce back and forth. I, I, God, it, my life might not be perfect, but I give you all that I am. I surrender to you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me, God, and not giving up on me. Come on, that hand you hold may be that very, they may be that, they need that prayer. They need to hear that prayer. God, don't give up on them. I love them and you love them. Let them know the love of Christ right now. This last part of this prayer is very important. I want you to pray this prayer. And I want you to, I want you to say this to God. Lord, open my eyes so that I can see the harvest. And when I see the need, let me make the difference. I am yours for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Now would you just lift your hands up one time and thank God right now. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. There's a world that needs to know a loving Savior cares for them. Help us to make that difference today. Let us come out of the shadows, step boldly into your kingdom, and we'll give you all the glory and the honor and the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Hug somebody's neck before you leave. Tell them you love in the Lord. Share the love of Christ with somebody this week.